Ron Paul almost has the total package, a strong, consistent message, enough money, and an energetic, motivated, surprisingly young support system. What he doesn't have after nine contests is a single win. Paul's delegate estimate is the lowest of the four major contenders, according to CNN estimates. And looking ahead to Arizona and Michigan, polls show Paul in third or fourth place. Joining me now from Missouri is a man in need of a breakthrough, our presidential candidate, Ron Paul. Um, Congressman, thank you so much for joining us. And I think it's fair to ask at this You're point, you, you get great crowds, you have enough, you do those money bombs, you, you get all that money, and yet you don't have a win. And it seems almost impossible to envision a presidential nominee that can't win in a state somewhere. Look ahead for me and tell me where you can win. Well, it all depends on how you measure winning. If you measure whether or not we're winning the maximum number of delegates in states, we actually have had wins even though the, you know, the final tally's not in, but that's what really counts. So some of these straw votes are straw votes, and sometimes they get very confused in counting votes. You know, take Iowa, for instance. We think we're going to have the most delegates out of Iowa. And the same thing probably about Maine, and they're still very confused up there on, on actually what is going on with the uh, popular vote. But the, I, I know there's a lot of political benefit to that, but the bottom line is who's going to get the delegates, and we think we're doing pretty good. And it seems like our momentum is, is just picking up. I am just uh, actually shocked at the uh, tremendous turnouts we've had. We've been uh, out on the road. Uh, we had eight, eight uh, functions here in the last three days. We've had 14,000 people turn out, and the enthusiasm seems to be growing. I know it's missing the national TV, but if anybody travels with us, they, they know something very special is going on in the frustration level. So those others who are at the top now doesn't mean they're going to stay there, not the way this campaign's been going. The, the question, though, is, and yes, you've certainly proven that you can get those enthusiastic crowds. I've seen them. You see them all the time, obviously. But the, the question, I guess, is does Ron Paul have a ceiling? Because your, your line in the polls pretty much steady from September, around 15%. It's just hard to see how you put together enough delegates to win the nomination. You could perhaps well, influence it, the nomination, but, but in your heart of hearts, uh, do you have a place where you think, you know, if I can't do it here, I'm going to have to rethink this? Well, you don't know until the end. I use the uh, track analogy. I used to run very hard, and I wasn't deciding anything in my own mind who's going to win and who's going to be in second place. I just run real hard. So uh, that's, to, that's to be decided, you know, later on. But uh, I, I just think there's, there's every reason uh, to believe that this momentum will continue because it is, you know, it is relatively early. Uh, I know in a week or so there's going to be a big difference, but... Uh, uh, no, there's, there's every reason to believe that uh, we're going to be in a very good position and we have to be optimistic. We know exactly what the odds are, yeah. but, uh, you know, nobody actually knows the future. You know that. Absolutely. No, uh, certainly I don't. Do you foresee yourself taking this all the way into August, even if you get to a point where you think, okay, the mathematics don't add up to a nomination for me. Do you f foresee yourself taking the delegates you do have and going to the convention in August? Well, uh, yeah, because right now uh, we don't know when the end is, whether it's going to be uh, May, June, July, or August. So I have to assume that uh, it will go in August because we're not going to uh, lock it up in May, obviously. So we, we just have to, you know, wait and see. So that, in my mind, I anticipate it's going to go on for a while. Okay. And that's certainly what the supporters want me to do. Let me read something that you told your uh, crowd yesterday, uh, I believe you were in Kansas City last night, um, where you said we, meaning the United States, we're slipping into a fascist system where it's a combination of government and big business and authoritarian, authoritarian rule and the suppression of the individual rights of each and every American citizen. Thematically, I have heard this before from you. Um, fascist, a fascist system is one of those things that's going to catch attention. Do you really think that the U.S. now has a fascist system? And point to me, uh, you know, some examples of that. No. Well, no, I don't, I don't think we do, but I worry about it a lot because we have a system of economics. We don't have socialism. What we have is interventionism. And when intervention is, exists, it serves the interests of the powerful special interests. And guess who they are? They're the big banks and the very wealthy corporations, and they get these benefits. 
So interventionism starts off with a combination of partnership between big business and government. And just look at the bailouts. Who got the bailouts? The middle class didn't get it. And, you know, did you see that statistic? I think it was CNN that showed I do the best with the middle class because I understand this. But, no, there's a coalition of big business and big government. And why I, I'm getting more nervous is because... Uh, fascism usually suggests this authoritarian, ruthless rule of government, you know, and they think of Mussolini and Hitler. But just think of this change in civil liberties that nobody wants to talk about, the arrest of American citizens now by the military and held indefinitely without a trial, and people aren't concerned about it. So yes, if we have uh, economic chaos like in, in something like what is in Greece or much worse, uh, yes, they could clamp down on us, so this is why I do worry about it, but we don't have this now. And I even mentioned last night in the speech, I said, we're not there. At least we can come and visit and meet, and we can have meetings like this, and we can change the course because Let's we actually uh, changed that bill on stop uh, uh, online piracy act, so people can still act out. So we're not there, but there's reasons why we should not be complacent. Let me ask you about a couple of your rivals. Uh, Rick Santorum has had uh, quite the rise in the polls. Do you believe today, uh, from what you see, that Rick Santorum can beat President Obama in November? Uh, well, no, I, I don't see how that, that's, uh, that's possible. And this whole idea about that whole talking about these social issues and who's going to pay for birth control pills. I'm worrying about, you know, the undermining of our civil liberties, the constant wars going on, the debt of, uh, you know, uh, 16 trillion dollars. And they're worrying about birth control pills. And here he's, he, he wants to, uh, you know, control people's social and, and lives. At the same time, he voted for Planned Parenthood. I mean, I don't see how anybody can get away with that inconsistency, pretending he's a conservative. And his voting record is, I think, from my viewpoint, an atrocious voting record, how liberal he's been in all the things he has voted for uh, over the many years he was in the Senate and in the House. Do you, are you uncomfortable? Uh, certainly, Rick Santorum is the one who's been in the forefront of some of this talk on social issues, but there have been others in the race. Are you uncomfortable with this talk about social issues, do you consider it a winning area for Republicans in November? No, I think it's a, a losing uh, position. I mean, I talk about it because I have a precise understanding of how difficult problems should be solved, and they're not to be at the national level. We're not supposed to nationalize these problems. The founders were very clear that uh, problems like this, if there needs to be legislation of sorts, the states have the right to write the legislation that they so choose. And that solves a lot of our problems. I mean, the whole idea that it's a national issue on who has to pay for birth control pills, but of course that comes from the fact that it, it's, it's a national mandate that the government controls insurance programs. Mm -hmm. Insurance is, to have true insurance, you have to have that done in the marketplace. You can't have that done by government. And, and quickly, if I could ask you, there's been a lot of talk um, that you and Mitt Romney seem to have a, a sort of a mutual truce going on. Can, can we take that as you believing that Mitt Romney would be, if it's not yourself, a, a good uh, presidential nominee for the Republican Party? Well, there's not much, uh, you know, on issues that we agree on, whether it's foreign policy or, you know, the personal liberties issue or the, uh, what's probably on taxes we might have an agreement. But, uh, no, I think they're all the same, you know, the same group. But the only thing that I mention when people sort of press me on that is management style. I think he certainly would have uh, a, a more, uh, you know, uh, acceptable management style when you consider uh, what I have seen and experienced from the other two candidates. I, I don't think they qualify there. But right. as far as issues goes, I'm uncomfortable with all three of them. I think, <laughs> I think they're the status quo, and they're not changing. They don't want to really change well, anything. That probably That's what means, I'm offering. My guess is we will be talking to you again. Thank you so much, Congressman Ron Paul, <laughs> presidential candidate Ron Paul. We appreciate it. See you down the road. By all appearances, the Republicans are fighting for the heart and soul of their own party.